Okay, well, uh, welcome to the presentation. Uh, my name is Les Hazelwood. I'm the Apache Shiro PMC chair. I'm also the CTO and co-founder of StormPath. <clears throat> um, just to get that out of the way, StormPath is a cloud identity management provider. So if you're building applications that are internet or publicly web facing and you need to integrate or manage users and authenticate them in a secure way, you know, avoiding some of the things that we've seen with Twitter and LinkedIn and Sony and those kind of guys, um, <clears throat> we prevent those, those things from happening. So we're a cloud-based ID, ID provider. We're specifically targeted developers. Uh, at our core, we're a REST JSON API, and then we offer Apache licensed SDKs that sit on top of the API that you can drop into your application. So <clears throat> that's StormPath. Um, wh what about Shiro? What is Apache Shiro? So Apache Shiro is an application security framework. It's something that an application developer um, drops into their source code as a library jar file or multiple jars <clears throat> to enforce security policies and, and behavior within an application. Uh, we're a top level project. We've been top level for a couple of years now. Um, the core focus of the project is to make security quick and easy to use. Um, security can be very difficult to understand, sometimes very challenging. Um, even <clears throat> for you know junior people coming out of high school or college, they may not have a good understanding of this stuff. So we do our best to really make things easy to use whenever possible. Um, and that's, that's the, the primary reason why we exist, um, and to simplify these more complex uh, topics. Um, <clears throat> the numbers are actually a lot bigger than this nowadays. This is an old number, but we, uh, Shira's a lot, especially in the last year and a half, has been adopted by a lot of uh, financial and government organizations. So um, government organizations who we cannot name, as well as you know, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and stuff, a lot of those guys use Shiro as their core security layer for their Java-based applications. <clears throat> so this is the agenda of what we're going to talk about. Um, Shiro at its core really focuses, focuses on what we consider four cornerstones of application security. There's authentication, access control, session management, and cryptography. And then in addition to those four cornerstones, um, Shiro also offers some nice uh, web support and auxiliary features for multi-threaded environments and whatnot. We'll talk about those at the end, but uh, we're gonna cover these four cornerstones first and then talk about <clears throat> the web and auxiliary support afterwards. So, but before we get started, I wanna cover some quick terminology. Um, these are words and terms that are used in, throughout Shiro's documentation in the source code and in this presentation, so I wanna make sure that we all get on the same page. But we refer to the subject quite a lot, quite a bit, <clears throat> and a subject is really just a security-specific view of an application user. Um, so it's basically the current person or thing executing or interacting with the software. Um, we don't use the word user because the word user often implies a human being, um, but a subject can be a human being, it can be a third-party process, it can be a, daemon, a system daemon that's running, anything that's currently interacting with the software. Principles are a subject's identifying attributes. So first name, last name, social security number, anything that identifies a subject is considered a principle. Of course, you should, or most applications typically have a single primary identifying principle, like a username or a, or a, a relational database primary key, something that uniquely identifies that subject uh, among all others. <clears throat> Credentials are secret values that verify identity. So. Passwords, of course, are the, probably the most referenced credentials. Um, X509 certificates, th uh, fingerprint scans, retina scans, these are all types of credentials that verify an identity. And finally, Shiro represents or talks about the notion of a realm quite a bit. And a realm for us is really a security-specific DAO or data source. <clears throat> it's really the, the representation of security-specific data for users, accounts, permissions, and whatnot. And it's the, th the thing that buffers Shiro from your actual data source. <clears throat> so those are terms. Any questions on these? No, okay, good. So let's, let's start talking about authentication. So we define authentication as, um, it's the process of verifying identity. It's proving a user is who they say they are. So just because I say I'm John Smith doesn't mean I'm really John Smith. I need to provide some additional information or credentials to actually verify that I am who I say that I am. And so <clears throat> that's what authentication is. This is some of the, these are some of the features that Shiro offers 
um, in, in its authentication process. Everything, in sh mostly, almost everything as that a developer interacts with, with Shiro is subject-based. So most of the security operations are performed on the currently executing subject. It's a single method call. You have one method to call, and if it's successful, they're logged in. If it's not successful, there's different conditions that you can process. There's a rich exception hierarchy that explains exactly why an authentication attempt would fail. Um, Shiro also supports the notion of remember me built in. So obviously if you go to a, a website and you enter your username and password and click remember me, it's built into the framework. And we have this notion of event listeners where you can listen to different failed or successful attempts via events. So you can plug into that for custom behavior based on what you might want in your application based on these events. So how do you authenticate with Shiro? How do you authenticate a user? The first step is to con collect principles and credentials. Um, and again, this could be anything. Shiro is protocol agnostic. So you acquire this information however you see fit. So for some, it's a username and password on an SSL-based form. <clears throat> Others, it's an X509 certificate or um, Kerberos or what have you. But the basic idea is you collect the principles and credentials you need. Then you submit them to the authentication system or to Shiro's authentication system. And you either allow access if they're successful or you allow them to retry if it's not successful or maybe after a certain amount of times you can block access for that account if, if they fail too many times. This is the, over, the overall process regardless of the actual type of authentication. But as an example, we'll show you what it looks like if you're using the most common username and password based authentication. So step one, we collect our principles and credentials. And in this case, we instantiate a username password token instance. This is an implementation of the authentication token interface. And of course, it takes in a username and password. <clears throat> in this particular example, we're, we're setting remember me to true because we want Shiro to remember the identity of the user um, on subsequent sessions. And that's it. We've collected our principles and credentials. There's not much more to it for this particular case. <clears throat> now that we have this, we need to submit it to Shiro. And so with Shiro, we have this notion of a security utils. And security utils get subject re returns a subject instance that represents the currently executing subject, the currently executing user. And so you can use this in your code anywhere to obtain the current, the current user. Um, in sh up to and including Shiro 1.2, this is thread local based. Um, future ver versions of Shiro will provide sort of an accessor interface that allows you to obtain the subject from different locations other than just thread local. Um, but most people care about the currently executing user and that almost always has a one to one correspondence with a thread. So, <clears throat> this has gotten the, the framework quite far, um, and it's, it's quite useful. But basically, you acquire the subject, and then the second line is you just pass the token to the login method. If this method returns quietly, you're done. The user is authenticated successfully. They can go on about their business using the application. But if it doesn't return successfully, <clears throat> there's any number of exceptions that you can catch and react to that indicate exactly why the authentication attempt failed. So, you know, maybe there isn't an account for that particular username or the account has been locked and therefore they're not allowed to use the, the application. Um, maybe they've specified an incorrect password. <clears throat> or you can, of course, catch the general authentication exception and, uh, and do, what you, do what you want. If there's no problems, again, you can show a particular view or some kind of response that indicates that everything's fine. <clears throat> I should also note here, though, that indicating to an end user, at least, why an authentication attempt fails is not a good idea, right? You don't want to ever let them know, you know, that either the account exists or the password's incorrect. You don't want to provide any information to an attacker that might be used to compromise an account. So this information is provided specifically for the developers using Shiro. The developers can catch these things <clears throat> and react to them in a way that makes sense for their application, but they should never show this information to the end user. So a little bit of... Uh, um, discrepancy, or not discrepancy, but discretion is needed when, when catching exceptions. Just the common recommendation we give to anyone is just indicate, you know, invalid username or password, right? That's the generic message that you see in a lot of login forms, and it doesn't give any legitimate information for an attacker. So it's there for the developer, <clears throat> but, uh, but be prudent about what you show your end users. How does this work? <clears throat> you know, we have this login call. How does it function? 
So this is a little bit of Shiro's architecture. So when you call the login method on a subject instance, <clears throat> what you're really doing is interacting with a proxy. And the subject is actually a proxy to the security manager. And the security manager here is Shiro's internal representation of a security manager, has nothing to do with the java.lang.security manager. So this is Shiro's API, but the subject is a proxy to the security manager. The subject indicates or represents rather a single identity, whereas the security manager can manage security operations for all users or all identities in an application. So when you call login, the security manager is actually invoked <coughs> And it in turn delegates to an internal authenticator object that will do what it needs to do. <clears throat> and so this is a common theme within Shiro Security Manager is it does a lot of things, authentication, access control, remember me. But in reality, the security manager is sort of an umbrella component that wraps other more specific components that are designated for a particular function. So in, in authentication case, we'll talk to an authenticator and the authenticator is the one for, responsible for performing the attempt. The authenticator, in turn, can go out and communicate or interact with multiple realms. It could be one realm, it could be multiple realms, maybe one of these is a, you know, a properties-based file that has username and password pairs, maybe another realm talks to LDAP or Active Directory, maybe a, another realm is for a proprietary data store. But the idea is that the authenticator accesses, excuse me, accesses identity information from any of these realms to perform the authentication attempt. And you can coordinate how that occurs with this notion of an authentication strategy. Um, you can plug in custom authentication strategies. There's a few that come out of the box, like uh, maybe the first one that succeeds is the one that we're going to use. Maybe uh, every one that is consulted has to succeed. And if any one of them fail, the authentication attempt fails. But the idea is that you can customize how the interaction occurs across Realm instances based on your needs. And again, we have more than a few out-of-the-box implementations that you can use based on your requirements. Any questions about this before we go on to authorization? Okay. So we've talked about authentication, proving identity. How does Shiro handle authorization? Um, so, and what we mean by authorization is, is it's really the process of determining who can do what. Um, it's otherwise known as access control in, in other venues. Um, but the idea of determining who is allowed to perform certain functionality or interact with specific resources, that's really authorization. And in Shiro, there are some core concepts that we have. The notion of permissions, which I'll cover what those are in a second, uh, roles and users. And again, we don't really have a user concept, we have a subject, but <clears throat> the idea is that you can perform role-based access control or very fine-grained uh, access control in, with permissions, and I'll explain how that, how that functions in a bit. Um, permissions are Shiro's most atomic security element. You can't break anything down further beyond a permission in, in Shiro's model. And a permission at its core is really a statement that describes a resource type and an associated behavior. So opening a file or deleting a user or, you know, sending a message. These are all actions that are taken upon particular resources. And permissions at their core really define what the application is possible, is capable of doing. So if a user can view a file or they can delete a user or they can, you know, open a document or send an email, right, these are all behaviors that can be taken within an application. They fundamentally, fundamentally define what the application can do. But they have no notion of who. So in the permission definition or permission statement, there's no notion of a user, you know, maybe Jay Smith can do these things. Um, and we'll, we'll explain how those associations are made in a second, but ideally they're just definitions of behavior and nothing more. This is also known as, you know, rights, rights management, rights, uh, rights control. <clears throat> in addition permissions, we have roles. And these are Kind of what people would expect when they when they think about role-based access control, where you basically have a name of a bunch of ro roles, and if I have the admin role, I can do whatever an administrator can do. If I have the user role, I can do whatever a user is allowed to do. But the interesting thing about traditional role-based access control is that typically they're just names, they're strings: administrator, user, um, <clears throat> contractor. Right? There's nothing inherent to the word that actually tells the software what that individual role is allowed to do. 
And so that is sort of an implicit construct, right? Just because I have a role called administrator means I could do administrative things, but nothing in software actually knows what those things are. So in Shira, we prefer to have roles be explicit constructs in that they're really a named collection of permissions. So if I have an administrator role that has the delete user permission and the, you know, create, you know, document permission and any of these kind of explicitly listed behaviors, the aggregate of those things together really form a set of behaviors that are allowed to be performed by a particular classification of user. And so Shiro's permission construct and the notion of roles that wrap those together gives you a really, really fine-grained, explicit way of defining who can do what within an application. And also, um, with Shiro, you can dynamically modify these things at runtime. So you can change what permissions are associated to roles, you can change you know, hierarchies of roles um, as your data store or your requirements allow you, or whatever your, your software requires, you can do these things at runtime and instantly see those changes without requiring the user to log out and log back in again. Um, and, if, and Shero has some caching layers in place to, uh, to help make that as fast as possible. <clears throat> Talk about caching a little bit. So users, right? This is really the who of the application, right? The, the J Smiths or the Damon accounts or you know the actual subjects that are interacting with the software. And so finally, we, we can assign to users or subjects permissions and roles, and it's based on these associations that really in turn tells the software what that subject's allowed to do. So if there is this concept of a printer permission, and you know maybe I can print to the printer on the third floor. If that permission is directly assigned with my user or one of the roles that are assigned to the user, then through that direct association or even transitive association, you know exactly what that user is allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Much more concrete representation of behavior than just a simple string name. And this is up to you. However you wish to model this in your application, whether it's relational database or LDAP or Active Directory, you can model this out in these associations however you desire. It's really the Shiro realm that translates your data model into a format that Shiro understands. <clears throat> so what are the features of authorization in Shiro? So again, like authentication, it's subject centric. You can do a security or, or excuse me, a permission or a role check based on the current user. Um, you can check against individual role names or an individual permission. Um, and Shiro provides this out-of-the-box wildcard permission that allows you to define your own kind of wildcard syntax. Um, maybe you can delete any user, or I can create any document or delete all users. Um, and you can use the wildcard character, the, the asterisk, to kind of build up your own definitions. Um, the permission itself is a class, or excuse me, an interface. So the implementation can be whatever you wish. Most people find the wildcard permission sufficient for their needs. Um, and again, any data model that you have to represent this will, will be fine. It's really the realms that decide, the realm that communicates with your data store that does the translation into a format that Shiro understands. So how do you authorize users with Shiro? There's a, there's a few means. Um, of course, programmatic, um, where you interact with the subject. We have uh, JDK 1.5 annotations that can be um, integrated with AOP. Um, to prevent methods from executing or not. And there is a JSP, GSP tag libraries available. There's also JSF s integration in the current trunk. It's not yet released, but um, you can control page output based on, on authorization state. <clears throat> so here's some examples. So in a, a simple role check, you know, I acquire the current user, and then I just do a check. You know, does the current user have the administrator role? And if so, maybe I show the delete user button. But maybe if they don't have that role, I don't show the button. Maybe I gray it out. You, know, you can change the functionality of your software or your user interfaces based on their, their uh, authorization capabilities. Here's a similar check using permissions. So in this, in this case, I am instantiating a permission instance <clears throat> where I have the, the type of object that's being interacted with is a user. Right? That's the user permission. The target, the actual identifier of the, of the actual object is J Smith, and the action being performed in this case is delete. And so this is a type safe way of representing behavioral statements 
you can instantiate this and then do a check. If the current user is permitted to delete the J. Smith user, then maybe I show the delete button on that page. Otherwise, maybe I don't show it. The really cool thing about this is that it's showing you an example of a very fine-grained access control check where you can get a level of granularity in your authorization that you just really can't get with roles. Um, if you don't want to create your own permission classes and you're okay with you know, foregoing type safety, you can use strings. And this is kind of where the wildcard permission comes into play. <clears throat> you can define your own string syntax and the wildcard permission has this notion of del delimited tokens with a colon. And in this case, the, the domain or the type of data is, is represented in the first token. The behavior being taken is the second token and the actual identifier of the instance to interact with is the, uh, the third token. And so you could take that string, pass it into, you know, if current user is permitted to do that permission, then maybe I show the button, maybe, otherwise I don't. So this is a case where it's convenient to create strings. And again, your realm is responsible for translating these things into permission instances that Shiro knows how to interact with. Um, and by default, all the, the, the base realms that Shiro provides translates these automatically to wildcard permissions. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to. So there's that option. There's also annotation checks. So in this example, um, maybe I want to open an account, but the only people that should be able to do that have, has, it, are the, those that are in the teller role, bank teller. And so if code executes and uh, the current subject does not have the teller role, then this method won't ever be invoked. An, accept, an authorization exception will be thrown you know, probably a transaction would be rolled back, but um, you can use annotations to prevent methods from being executed. Similarly, there's also an annotation for permission checks. So you can have, you know, a common delimited list of one or more of these to make sure that the current subject is permitted to do these things <coughs> before the method is executed. Any questions about authorization? Uh, that is actually dependent upon your runtime environment. So Shiro has Aspect J support by default. Um, we have integration for Spring as well. So if you're using Spring, it just uses Spring's AOP based proxy support. Um, Juice has its own mechanism, I believe, for this stuff. But it's really based on whatever your runtime is that you want. Um, you could just plug in whatever AOP support that we have. Another question? So that was authorization and authentication. And that's where a, most of the modern kind of security frameworks stop in their, their scope. But Shiro actually goes and, and, and deals with a couple other things that are, we, we feel are pretty critical to a security experience. Um, and those are session management and cryptography. So I'll cover session management now. Session management is managing the life cycle of a subject-specific temporal data context. And that's really just a mouthful to mean what we're all comfortable and familiar with with HTTP sessions, right? It's a session represents a bunch of data that's specific to a particular end user, and you can you know, add or remove data from it, and the context goes away when the user's either logged out or their session expires. So nothing out of the ordinary if, you know, based on the HTTP sessions. <clears throat> Here are some features. So one of the cool things about Shiro is that it allows heterogeneous client access. And by that I mean as long as you have a secure handle to like a session identifier, you can access session state and contribute to session state from any client technology. So um, part of this came out years ago when I was working on a government contract and they had a Java-based web application and a desktop um, Java application or an embedded uh, Java applet. And two of those are technically fundamentally different types of client technologies. <clears throat> but they both needed to share and, and, and operate with and, and share data in the same actual session. EJBs couldn't do this at the time um, because they, EJBs maintain communication state. And of course the web server didn't know about a desktop based operating mechanism. So Shiro allows you from different clients to access the same session state if need be. Um, everything in Shiro session management and actually everything in Shiro in general is POJO J2SE based. It's IOC friendly, so you don't need any special interfaces or APIs to make Shiro work. 
Um, like the authentication, there are event listeners, so you can listen to various events during the session's lifecycle um, when users log in and when they log out. <coughs> um, there's also, we also retain the host address from where the session's initiated. So if you, for example, in intranet kind of security policies, you might want to restrict access to applications based on the host IP from where they originate. So we'll retain that information if that's necessary for you in security policies. And we also off offer this notion of inactivity and expiration support via a touch method. So if you're creating a rich client application like a Flex application or um, a JavaScript application, and the end user is actively using the, the user interface, but they're not invoking any server-side calls, it's, it's likely that the server-side session will expire even though they're actively using the software. And so there's a touch method that can be invoked um, on behalf of a client that will just keep the session alive to make sure that it doesn't expire if they're legitimately using the software application. So maybe in, in like a Flex or a, um, a JavaScript app, you can send in a, requ a request to the server every five minutes to prevent it from timing out if they're actually using the software. And it's also transparent in the web tier. So Shiro implements the servlet specification for HTTP, the HTTP session API and the HTTP servlet request API. So you can use Shiro sessions inside of any servlet container like Tomcat or Jetty or what have you, and um, your code doesn't have to change because it's the same API. One of the nice, probably, the most powerful reasons for doing this is that you can now get container independent session clustering. So Shiro allows you to plug in a clustering data store or clustered data store into its session management infrastructure and that means that you don't have to change your, your session clustering configuration um, much whether you're in development or you go into production or, or you know alpha beta. So if you're using maybe you know, Geronimo in production and, and Jetty in testing, you don't have to change any of that <coughs> um, cluster configuration because it, Shiro just works with it all. So if they all point to, say, a memcache cluster, none of the, your application's configuration needs to change based on environment. That's got a lot of a, a real bit of appeal for people that have to work in multi-environment scenarios. The other benefit is that once you, once you cluster in Shiro once, you don't have to worry about how to, how to do things specifically in Jetty or in Tomcat or Geronimo or JBoss, right? It's all done the same way. You don't have to worry about multiple different clustering mechanisms. So how do I create a session or how do I get access to one? Um, it's basically identical to what you've seen with the, the servlet request API or the HTTP servlet request, except replace request with subject. So, um, when I call subject.getSession, it guarantees that a session exists. If it doesn't exist, it will automatically create one at that time. Otherwise, I can pass in a Boolean argument to, to say, you know, give me the session if it exists, but don't create one for me if it doesn't. So we're all very familiar and comfortable with these things uh, based on the server request API. I should also note, though, this actually a really important point for this stuff is sessions work in any environment. You don't have to be in an HTTP server. You don't have to be in an EJB server. We've, we have people with, you know, using Shiro and mobile phones creating server-side sessions even though they're not using the HTTP protocol. So the same unified session experience of the API works in any tier, in any deployment environment, regardless of your container, which is a really nice benefit, too, for consistency. And the API is, again, what you'd probably expect, right? There's a start timestamp, the last access time. You can get and set attributes. You can set the time out of the session. There's the touch method that we covered briefly where you can prolong the session's lifetime if necessary. All things that we're mostly comfortable with with the servlet request API. Same kind of mirrored API in, in Shiro session. Any questions about the session API before we move on? Or how sessions work, how session clustering? Yes? Is the timeout stuff linked to the remember me stuff for authentication? Yes, so it's timeout and session for the user coming to when the head you're remembering the uh, the secret No, they're they're independent. They're not linked at all. Um, so in Shiro there's a there's this notion. So as you saw with authentication, right, you have this master security manager that wrapped an authenticator. Well, there's also a remember me manager that it wraps in addition, and you can configure that to specify 
how long the cookie stays alive or you know any other storage techniques other than cookies perhaps you know you get to configure how that stuff operates but it's actually an interesting point I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um, there's this notion in Shiro of remember me <clears throat> versus authentication state and Shiro distinguishes the two completely separate um, on purpose for security reasons um, and here's a really good example let's say you're using um, Amazon.com and you, you log in one day and you add some books to your shopping cart but then you go home at the end of the business day you forget to log out and you come back <clears throat> tomorrow Amazon will remember who you are right it remembers your name it, rem it shows you what what your recommendations are and maybe your cart but if you want to change your credit card at that time Amazon forces you to log in because your authentication state with Amazon is remembered but you're not authenticated right authentication has a very strong connotation with proof um, and so Shiro retains that state for you automatically. And so on the subject API, you can do subject dot is authenticated or dot is remember me, and they're orthogonal, actually opposing concerns. So if one returns true, the other is going to return false. Um, and we do that specifically for the scenario that I just outlined. Because you're remembered by a cookie, it does not mean that you've actually proven your identity in the context of the current session. And that's really important for things like, you know, the scenario I just described or banking situations. Um, but Shiro remembers that state, so you don't have to worry about how to resolve that, that, that issue. Okay, any other questions about sessions? Okay, let's talk about cryptography. <clears throat> cryptography, as you might expect, is basically protecting information from undesired access by hiding it or converting it to nonsense. And so the, the core kind of elements of cryptography that Shiro supports is this notion of ciphers and hashes. And the cipher is a, uh, an encryption, in, or encrypt, sorry, a cipher allows you to encrypt and decrypt data based on shared and or public private keys. Um, it's a transformation process, uh, a mathematical algorithm based on the notion of keys. <coughs> And there's two types of ciphers that come up frequently. There's notions of symmetric ciphers, which use the same or trivially similar key to encrypt and decrypt data. And within symmetric ciphers, there's, there's two types of them. There's really block ciphers and stream ciphers. <clears throat> it's important to know here, however, that a stream cipher doesn't just encrypt streams of data, like an input stream, for example. And a block cipher only works on, on byte arrays. Um, the notion of the word stream has to deal with the key itself. Not, not what you're encrypting or decrypting. So a stream cipher has a stream of key bits, and a block cipher has a chunk of bits, basically a byte array. <clears throat> um, in addition to symmetric ciphers, there's asymmetric ciphers, which use totally different keys. So you know the RSA, kind of public-private key approach um, that we're all familiar with is an example of an asymmetric cipher. And hashes. So a hash is a one-way irreversible conversion of an input source. Um, this is also known as a message digest. <laughs> and it's most commonly used for credentials transformation. So if I've got a password and I want to change it to a, a format that people can't understand or can't, can't reverse, uh, you, can, you can use it for passwords. It's also obviously like MB5 is used to create checksums for files. So you can see if a file's been manipulated in transmit, you can check the checksum to, say, to make sure that it's the same. And Shiro can be used, <clears throat> can, can basically hash anything with an underlying byte array. So files, streams, um, and we'll show you an example of that API in just a second. So some of the stuff that we really focused on when creating the cryptography stuff in Shiro is that, again, we wanted to really focus on simplicity, regardless of your knowledge or understanding of underlying cryptographic concepts. Um, it's all interface driven and POJO based, so there's no no surprises there. Um, we, ha we don't, however, implement our own cryptography infrastructure. We, sh we sit on top of the existing JCE that's part of the JDK. So we're not there to reinvent the wheel and rewrite all the crypto algorithms. Um, we sit on what exists already. So that means if you, like, for example, plug in Bouncy Castle into your, your JCE environment, Shiro can now work with that stuff as well. But the big reason why it exists is that it kind of really object orientifies a lot of these cryptography concepts. If you've ever worked with, how many people in here have worked with the, the JDK or JCE cipher object? 
Okay, great. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad to see we have a, a large representation. So as you probably know, it's not fun to work with, right? It's stateful. It throws a lot of checked exceptions. Um, it's a pain in the ass to use, and you have to be really careful about, you know, the constructor arguments that are or at least th that are used to acquire one. It is, it is not fun. Shiro's wrapper APIs are a lot cleaner, a lot easier to use, and the API is much easier to understand. So ultimately, it's, it's an OO hierarchy. Right? The, uh, we've changed it into a service level kind of mechanism where you invoke a method on a service and you get a result. You don't have to worry about state. You don't have to worry about um, the difficulties in managing the state. <clears throat> and so you'll see in Shiro's API, there's a JCA cipher service. There's an abstract symmetric cipher service. There's a de default block cipher service. So we have a hierarchy that represents the mathematical concepts um, that are true to their nature. And in Shira, you just instantiate a, a class. If you've, again, if you've worked with the JCE and you want to acquire a Cypher instance, you have to specify this crazy thing called a transformation string using factory methods where you take these strings and you delimit them with slashes and then you hope to God that your configuration is correct and you just call a method and see if it works, which is um, not OO and it's, it's, it's not type safe. You know, it's, it's a little weird for me to, to see that kind of stuff in, in the JDK, but they're a pain to work with, and if you don't understand what the configuration parameters are in this transformation string, um, you could obviously break something and, and even worse, have less secure uh, encryption going on because you don't understand what these things mean. The other really important thing about Shiro's wrapper around this stuff is that <clears throat> we provide more secure default settings in the JDK. So um, things like cipher modes of operation, initialization vectors, we, we automate and incorporate these things out of the box even if you have no idea what they are. Um, so I'll give you an example of, of how this works. <clears throat> JDK by default uses I think the ECB cipher mode which is the, it stands for electronic cookbook and the ECB ci cipher mode for block ciphers is not really secure at all. And as an example, you know, let's say we wanted to encrypt you know, this image of Tux. And this, this is our plain text that's gonna go in through encryption. And we're just gonna, you know, create a cipher using a default transformation string. Maybe it's some factory string that I picked up off the internet that I copied and pasted. And obviously, I'm using AES 256-bit and everything's gonna work fine and I feel good about my encryption and we're fine. But that's not the case. Because if you don't change the mode of operation, to something other than ECB, this is the resulting output of the encrypted image, which as you can see is not secure at all. Your data is not secure if you use the standard JDK settings. And most people don't realize to change these things when they're using encryption. They just think, oh, it's 256-bit AES, I'm, I must be good. Um, <clears throat> however, Shiro does do, do the, the more complicated things such as changing the mode, auto-generating an initialization vector. How many people here know what an initialization vector is? Right, better question, how many people do not know what an initialization vector is? Okay. So an initialization vector is ideally a seed of random data that kickstarts your encryption process. And so if you have a random byte array, a random seed from a secure random number generator, and that's incorporated in your cipher algorithm, all the bits that come out of your cipher process are randomized in a, based on that initial token or that initial seed. And it's really, it's basically like having a salt for a hash, right? You, you need some sort of random input data to make sure your output is secure. If you don't provide an initialization vector, you can encrypt this image, for example, 20 different times and you'll see the same thing 20 different times. It's not a good thing. If you provide an initialization vector, however, this is what the output would look like. So it's completely randomized. You can't infer at all what was behind that data. And Shiro automatically creates and appends initialization vector data to your encrypted output. So you don't ever have to worry about these things. Yes? So do you switch from ECB to CBC or ESSIB? CBC is the default. So <clears throat> because anything greater than 128-bit requires the JCE extensions, we default to 128-bit um, AES encryption with uh, CBC mode of encryption. And of course, uh, we auto-generate um, an initialization vector equivalent to the block size of the algorithm. <clears throat> but again, if you don't know what any of this stuff means, you can rest assured that when you use Shiro, you're gonna get some secure output. And then you can configure these things in the settings and the ECB mode and the, the padding scheme and all these other things, you can configure them as simple POJO properties on the cipher that you've created. 
You don't have to worry about transformation strings. You get type safe methods that you can, that you can call and interact with. Uh, much easier to use and understand as you start to learn more about the different security options on the ciphers. So this is our cipher service. <clears throat> Unlike the cipher class in the JEK, it is a stateless mechanism. Basically, you make a single call, and what comes out, you know, it's a single method operation. You make it, you invoke it, and your operation is done. You can also, excuse me, encrypt and decrypt streams of data in addition to standard byte arrays. And a byte source is just sheer a simple wrapper around a byte array that allows you to do things like base 64 encoding and decoding. But <clears throat> single method operation, stateless. When, when the method's done, your work is done, you can move on with the data that comes out. So much more aligned with what most application developers want out of a crypto API. Oh, and again, you don't see any exceptions here. There is a cipher exception that Shiro has. In fact, Shiro has exceptions across the board. Our philosophy is that everything's a runtime exception. You don't have to catch things if you don't want to, um, but you can, of course, catch whatever you wish. Um, and it's all documented in the Java doc, what's thrown. So you're not forced to catch exceptions if you don't want to. <coughs> And so, of course, within Shiro's implementation, there's, you know, default interface implementations. So we have MD5, the SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-2 SHA family of, of hash uh, algorithms. Um, there's built-in hex and base64, you know, conversion, which to this day blows my mind that they're actually part of the JDK still all these years later. So Shiro has them. You, don't, you, you can use them out of the box. Um, and there's also built-in support for salts and repeated hashing four hashes, and I'll explain why that's important in a little bit. <clears throat> so we saw the Cypher service. Here's the hash interface. Uh, it's very simple. Once a hash is computed, you can get the bytes. You can call two hex, two base 64. Really nice. You know, you don't have to worry about how do I go find that, that hacky chunk of code that I've looked at all the time uh, on the internet to copy and paste in my project, um, but you can use that. Or actually, I think Commons has one as well. Um, but they're built into the interface. You can call them. And our, our hashing API is also much cleaner and more intuitive, like we think, compared to the message digest class in the JDK, right? You have to, you have to use a factory method to get an algorithm. You have to try catch, you know, messaging ex or message exception or whatever the JDK has. For us, you could just take in data into the constructor called two hex. You can take in a file. You can take in a stream. You know, maybe I have a password that I want to SHA-512 it, you know, take in a hash, maybe do a thousand iterations. And then I can finally get the base 64 value of that. <clears throat> These are all things that we as application developers wish that were in the JDK. So uh, they're in Shiro for sure. <clears throat> Any questions about the hashing support? Any, anybody know why we have an iteration count on, on the constructor? So it takes in a password and a, an assault. Why would you have an iteration count? Why, why, would you, why might you want to hash a password more than once? What's that? Yep, key strengthening. Um, and it, basically computational complexity, right? The, if I'm an attacker and I have access to the raw hash values, maybe I've compromised your database and I can see your password hashes. You know, I might have a rainbow table well, actually, salts help prevent against rainbow tables, but I might have to, for each one of the passwords, try to encrypt or hash it a number of times. Maybe it's a thousand. This, a thousand, by the way, is just an example. It's really bad to go that low because modern GPUs will easily, you know, be able to go through a thousand iterations on SHA very really quickly. Um, but maybe half a million, a million iterations. <clears throat> this will increase the time that a comparison is required, say, for a login attempt maybe a little bit, maybe like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seconds. That's negligible for most end users. Most people logging into a UI, they'll never see that extra delay. But if you're an attacker and you're trying to compromise hundreds of thousands of passwords that you are able to compromise from a database, this will t exponentially increase the amount of time it takes you to try to compromise the password database. So we recommend that you use um, a complexity factor, like an iteration count, um, also probably in Shiro 1.3 we'll have bcrypt natively supported using the the Blowfish, um, the Blowfish key scheduler to artificially slow down the computing process. So the, these are more techniques that are used to uh, thwart attackers in the event that your password database is actually compromised. 
Always salt your passwords, though. Always, without without question, and they should always be random. You should never have a salt based on something that can be derived, like a username or an email address or something. <clears throat> so anyway, it's really easy to create uh, different um, hashes in Shiro, and there's also a generic hash class I can't remember that allows you to to pass in the name of the algorithm. So if there's a hash algorithm that you want to use that's not part of the JDK, maybe it's in Bouncy Castle or something, you can pass that in as well. Okay, any questions about cryptography and hashing before we go on to web support? Yeah. So the web is obviously super important these days. Um, and so Shiro, although the four cornerstones are the basis of the framework, we have really, really good and solid web support. In fact, probably the majority of people who use Shiro use it because of the web support. Um, setting it up is pretty easy. It's a basically a simple um, web a filter inside of web.xml. Um, and you can use Shira to protect all of the URL endpoints in your application. Um, it's got some pretty innovative, innovative filtering um, techniques uh, with URL specific filter chains. So if you've ever had you know, filter soup inside of web.xml trying to figure out what filters are, are processing which requests is a really big pain in the butt. Shiro um, has a really nice clean way of, of helping you determine the exact flow of a request through a chain and it's easy to see visually. So we'll show you what that looks like. Of course, as I mentioned before, there's JSP tag support. And again, there's transparent HTTP session support. So if you are using Shiro's native sessions and session clustering, you don't have to change any of your web code because we implement the serverless API for sessions. Here's an example of how to configure Shiro's filter inside of WebXML. Um, this has changed a little bit since Shiro 1.2. Um, we have a con servlet context listener that you also um, specify, but this is the basic gist of it. You specify your filter, and then in the filter mapping, you specify a URL pattern of slash star. So we want Shiro to intercept and filter every single request that comes into your application. And you'll want to set this filter mapping higher up in the file compared to any other filter mapping to make sure that Shiro sits in front of all the rest. <coughs> and here's an example of some configuration for Shiro. So you can, because everything in Shiro is POJO based, you can use any POJO based configuration mechanism that you want. So whether it's Spring XML or JBoss Beans XML or whatever you have, you can use that. But we also provide INI as sort of the lowest common denominator configuration format if you don't want to use these other mechanisms. So in this example, in the main section, we're basically configuring a realm to talk to an LDAP server and then we configure that realm on the security manager. And this is basically what, what we like to call on the Shiro dev team is like poor man's dependency um, or inversion of control or dependency injection. So basically via simple kind of object graph navigation kind of uh, syntax, you can set properties and objects on each other and, and it's pretty easy to use. <clears throat> In the URL section though, this is kind of what's interesting for the web stuff, you can specify as key value pairs a ant-based path expression on the left, and on the right-hand side of the equal sign, it's a comma-delimited list of filter names that you want to execute for that particular endpoint, which is really nice because if you look here, you can see that, for example, on the remoting endpoint, anything that matches remoting or anything below it is going to go through the authentication filter, then it's going to make sure it has the B2B client role, then it's going to make sure it does whatever else that comes after it. So, in a very succinct kind of format, you can visually see exactly what filters are being executed and in what order. <clears throat> and you can define filters inside of the Shiro's main section. There's a, there's a bunch of defaults that come enabled out of the box, so like there's an SSL filter to enforce SSL connections, there's authentication, authorization, there's HTTP basic authentication filter, there's all sorts of things that come out of the box. You can of course define your own and then use them in these filter chains. So it's a really succinct easy way to enforce security policies without having to, you know, go searching through a web XML. <clears throat> Here's how you might use some of the JSP tag libs. So Shiro has a, a tag, tag lib, in this case we've given it the prefix of Shiro, it could be whatever you want. And in here we're showing the particular link to manage users is only visible if you have the administrator role. But if you don't have the role, if you lack the role, um, you know, we'll show some other text or some other kind of buttons. So <clears throat> this is just a very simple example of how you can control page rendering based on security state. There's a whole bunch of other kind of tags that you can use. You can determine, you know, common scenario is 
if they're a guest, show them the login link. But if they're not a guest, if they're a user, you know, show them the you know welcome Tony kind of message. You can use all these tags to change the output based on the current state of the end user. So you can check for permissions, roles, um, see if they're authenticated or not. And all of this stuff has been replicated as of late in the in the trunk in the JSF support. So should work fine for JFS, JSF users. And finally, we have some auxiliary features that we'll cover quickly. As I mentioned before, getting a current subject is um, currently in, in Shiro tied to a thread local, which can pause, cause some problems for threading and multi um, or concurrent execution. So what Shiro has is a couple of wrapper executor services and scheduled executor service and whatnot that wrap the incoming call in a callable or runnable object that retains the subject state across threads. So if you are executing on one thread and then you dispatch to an executor service to do some asynchronous processing, sure will automatically, without your code even having to adapt to it, retain the run as, or excuse me, the, the subject's identity and authentication state across threads. And when that thread is done executing, it automatically cleans up the thread. So you have multi-threading and concurrency support using the, the callable runnable. We have run as support, so it allows you to kind of pop a stack of identities on the currently executing user. So it's really useful in scenarios where, you know, maybe I am an administrator logged into a web console and I want to run as particular end user so I could see whatever they're seeing. You can have run as support and show <coughs> by interacting with the subject. You can create subjects whenever you want. Um, right up until now, you'd only seen security utils .get subject, but if you're a framework developer or another Apache project committer, you can create subject instances based on an incoming request or an incoming remote method invocation or what have you um, based on subject state using a subject builder um, that uses the builder design pattern to you know, basically populate the state that's required. And then once the subject's created, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we have unit testing support. so. Naturally, using thread locals and certain um, static method calls is kind of a pain in certain environments. So we have some unit testing support out of the box that allows you to, to uh, simulate you know, currently logged in users. And again, I had mentioned earlier about the notion of authenticated versus remembered. Um, it's really important that Shiro remembers that state. You can choose to use those methods, is authenticated or is remembered. Um, to customize your UI if you wish. If you, if you don't care, then it's, it's not a big deal, but sure remembers the state in case you need it. And finally, logging out. <coughs> After the user's done, they can call, you can get the subject and then just call logout on it, and it validates their security state. It, it'll close out their session automatically. Um, and then to, to perform application-specific logout logic, you can do whatever you need to before or after this call. You can also listen, listen for authentication or stop session events and react accordingly. <clears throat> and in 1.3 and 2.0, we've got some pretty cool things that are coming out. Um, we now have a really nice type safe event bus in, in the project. So what that allows us to do as a development team is trigger type safe events that contain a bunch of information and you can, list, you can create listeners that listen to those particular events. And so it gives you a much lower, looser kind of high cohesion, low coupling plug-in capability into Shiro. So you can just implement listeners and implement specific functionality without having to subclass you know, Shiro specific components. And so we're moving towards more event-driven kind of architectures in, in newer revisions. Um, in earlier versions of Shiro, there was a lot of, you know, subclassing techniques where you had to take a Shiro class, subclass it, override a method. And, you know, obviously we want to favor composition over inheritance, so the new stuff that's coming out or the newer stuff is all going to be composition based, so you can plug in objects instead of having to subclass things or implement an interface and plug it in, so it's a lot easier to work with. Um, we're going to have stronger JEE support, so I mentioned JSF should be coming out. Um, we'll have better CDI support for the, the JEE crowd. There'll probably be a default Realm implementation. Right now, all of the Realms are specific to a technology that interacts with your data store. So we'll have a JDBC Realm or an LDAP Realm or a relational database, or I mean a um, file system Realm. <clears throat> and in the vast majority of all these Realms, there's things like caching and permission creation that are all common across all of them. So we'll probably have a default Realm implementation 
where you can plug in strategies that allow you to look up account data and, and kind of authentication data. So this will be more pluggable. And one of the other things that we've had a lot of feedback on is this notion of it doesn't exist yet, but we want to add a, what we're calling a default authentication filter that will support any number of HTTP authentication schemes and then fall back to like a user interface based page to support user login. So <clears throat> this is becoming more prevalent in modern API based services where if I authenticate via OAuth or, or HTTP basic, then I'm authenticated. But if I don't authenticate via any of those means, then redirect me to a login page before I continue to use the app. And so you'll be able to do that all with a single filter um, that you can configure. So that's it, you know, um, thanks for your time. If you want to give a shot, you know, take a look at StormPath. We, uh, Shiro can enforce stuff in your app. StormPath can be an identity provider for Shiro in the cloud as Spring Security and other things as well. So if you feel that you have cloud publicly facing web apps, StormPath might be a good solution for you. And we also integrate natively with Active Directory behind firewalls. So if that's a problem you're trying to solve, we, we solve that problem too. Thanks for your time. Um, I'm here for any questions. Um, we have four and a half minutes left, so if you have anything, yeah. Uh, can we separate the modules of Shiro and use it uh, individually? If there's a need in a certain application, you want to use the, uh, the programming module, or let's say if I only want to use the concept of rules and permissions and not use the actual login, is that uh, doable? So the question is, is can we use separate modules within Shiro? So if I only want to use the cryptographic modules, can I just use that and not maybe the login stuff or vice versa? And the answer to that today is no, but in Shiro 2, I think we're going to be able to do that in a lot cleaner fashion. So um, if you depend on Shiro core, you'll get crypto out of the box, as well as subject-based login and stuff like that. Um, things like integration with LDAP and Active Directory, those will be separated into their own modules in we're gonna to try to have a much more modular approach. And part of the reason for that is to reduce the file, the amount, the, the size of the files required to run like in a mobile application. So we've had people who run in mobile that want smaller jars so that they can only re depend on what they absolutely require. So because that will probably involve some backwards incompatible things, it's probably gonna to have to wait till 2.0, but, but yeah, it's on the roadmap. So the question is, is you know, permissions are kind of represented in a realm, and then the realm can represent this information however it wants in LDAP or Active Directory or Relational Database. Are there any tools to utilize to convert between your data source and Shiro's internal representation? Currently, there's not. So the way that most people end up doing that is they subclass the realm to do whatever they need. And as they do a query from their data source, they just spit out those strings that Shiro understands, or you can return the actual permission instances. Most people tend to like the string-based representation so they don't have to worry about type safety or creating specific subclasses. So it usually becomes a exercise of let me query this database table, concatenate the columns, and then return it to Shiro, and Shiro just works. So, but there's no actual tools used it's because it's very data source specific. Yep, absolutely. You could either do that or, like I said, you know, have a little uh, helper component that does it in Java. You know, it's up to you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for your time. Um, if you need to contact me, there's my contact info. I'm always available via email and Twitter, so thanks.